So before I talk about why pair production cannot happen in vacuum or free space, let's just talk a little bit about pair production, what it is and what is pair annihilation. So every particle in the universe has its corresponding what is known as antiparticle. So an antiparticle is a particle which has a uh, same mass as the original particle but other properties could be different. For example, the electron has an antiparticle which is known as either an anti-electron or a positron. So the positron has the same mass as that of an electron but its charge is exactly the opposite. So the electron is negatively charged but the positron is positively charged. So the nature of particle antiparticle is such that when a particle and an antiparticle come together then they annihilate each other. They destroy each other completely and lead to the creation of energy. Alright, so when an electron and a positron come together then they will annihilate each other and lead to the creation of pure energy which is released in the form of a photon of very high energy, usually a gamma photon. And the energy of that gamma photon is basically a result of the rest mass energies of both the electron and the positron. So the electron's rest mass, if I write it down as let's suppose m0, you already know the rest mass of an electron which is around 9.1 into 10 to the power minus 31 kilograms. Then the energy associated with the rest mass is m0 c squared, which turns out to be around 0.51 mega electron volt. Similarly, since the rest mass of electron and positron are same, the rest mass energy of a positron is also 0.51 mega electron volt. So when an electron and a positron were initially at rest, but they come close because of attraction due to opposite charges, then they annihilate and lead to the creation of a very high energetic photon and the energy of that photon is nothing but the sum of the rest mass energies of the electron and the positron which is nothing but 2m0 c square. So if you add these two you end up getting 1.02 mega electron volt. So the annihilation of an electron and positron pair will yield a minimum of 1.02 mega electron volts. However, the energy could be greater if the particles initially had some kind of a kinetic energy due to its motion. So the kinetic energy of an electron and positron before annihilation will get added to the total amount of energy released during annihilation. So we can say that for a general case, this kinetic energy is added to the rest mass energy of the photon which is released. Now we can write this expression quite simply instead of writing it in terms of the rest mass energy we can write it in terms of the relativistic mass by saying that this is basically equal to the sum of the relativistic mass of the electron and positron pair. Now what is relativistic mass? So every time a particle is moving then the mass associated with its motion is known as a relativistic mass because when the particle is at rest then the mass associated with it is known as rest mass. The rest mass and the relativistic mass are not exactly same. This comes as a result of a relativity and this is because as a particle is moving it has a kinetic energy associated with its motion and the kinetic energy is manifested as an increase in the mass of the particle itself. So we know that mass and energy are equivalent where there is energy there is mass and there is mass there is energy. So when a particle is at rest its mass has an energy but when the particle is moving the kinetic energy is reflected as an increase in the mass of the particle. So for a particle in motion the total amount of energy can simply be written as m c square all right or m c square for the positron also where m is not the rest mass but m is the relativistic mass which is written as m is equal to root over 1 minus v square upon c square. So if the electron and the positron were initially moving then the total amount of energy which basically includes the rest mass energy and the kinetic energy of the particle is basically mc square. So therefore generally speaking we can write it simply by uh, uh, using the sum of these two quantities which is basically this is nothing but 1 by root over 1 minus v square by c square is the gamma factor which is I'll just write here as gamma m0. So this I can write as 2 gamma m0 c square. Have you understood what I've done? So for a general case where initially the particles were moving, I want to include the kinetic energy expression also and to include the kinetic energy the simplest way to do it is by writing the relativistic mass because the relativistic mass contains within it 
not only the rest mass but also the increase in mass due to increase in kinetic energy so this expression contains within it the rest mass energy as well as the kinetic energy associated with the particles motion so this is known as pair annihilation when an electron and a positron come together then they annihilate or destroy each other and lead to the creation of pure energy and that pure energy is the result of the rest mass energies of the particle and the kinetic energy of the initial particles the opposite phenomena is also possible which is known as pair creation or pair production so in pair annihilation particle antiparticle come together lead to the creation of pure energy but in pair production energy if it is sufficient enough can lead to the creation of a particle antiparticle pair so the opposite or the reverse process happens in the case of pair production pure energy under suitable conditions can lead to the creation of a particle and antiparticle pair if it has sufficient energy so of course this is the limiting factor and the excess amount of energy goes off as kinetic energies of the particle however there is one distinction which is why i made this video in the first place Pair annihilation can happen anywhere. It can happen in a material medium. It can also happen in a vacuum or empty space. Nothing forbids it. However, pair production cannot happen in vacuum. Pair production always requires the presence of a material medium or the presence of some kind of an external object nearby. It cannot happen in vacuum or empty space. And the answer to why is it so goes down to basically conservation laws so if i look at the conservation laws associated with this process uh, specifically the conservation of energy and the conservation of momentum as i'll show you we cannot conserve energy and momentum simultaneously for this process if there is no external material or an atom or a nucleus present nearby so let me show you how we can come to that conclusion. So let's look at the conservation laws of energy and momentum for this particular case. So you have a gamma photon, which is extremely high energetic. The energy of this gamma photon is greater than this quantity. Why am I drawing the diagram in this particular manner is that the gamma photon, if it is moving in this direction, has some initial linear momentum in this direction. All right. The gamma photon does not have uh, momentum associated in this particular perpendicular direction. So the particle antiparticle should also have a similar kind of momentum so therefore the particle antiparticle will move in this direction so the combined linear momentum is also facing this words and also the linear momentum is in this axis should be zero and by imposing that I can say that the angle at which the particle antiparticle is created let's suppose it is theta is also equal why because the linear momentum in this perpendicular direction initially was zero so the linear momentum in this perpendicular direction after the pair production should also be zero so they should cancel each other out since they have same mass they should be ejected at same angles to cancel out the linear momentum in this particular direction the only linear momentum existing will be in this particular direction so let's suppose the linear momentum of the electron is given by p and the linear momentum of the positron is given by p here so the electron will have a linear momentum in this direction which is given by p cos theta yes and the positron will also have a linear momentum in this particular direction which is also given by p cos theta yes so now we can look at the conservation laws of energy and momentum first let's look at the conservation law of energy so if i write down the conservation law of energy then i can say that the total amount of energy of the gamma photon which is basically h nu is basically equal to the total amount of energy of the electron and the positron which is nothing but this particular equation so the gamma photon leads to the creation of an electron positron pair so the relativistic mass of the electron positron pair will come out of m naught c square this is the first equation this has to hold true for conservation of energy to hold true now let's look at the conservation of momentum so the light photon has a momentum associated with it yes the momentum of the light photon is nothing but its energy divided by the speed of light which is e upon c yes or this is equal to h nu upon c so the momentum of the light photon is its energy upon c or h nu upon c and the momentum of the light photon in this direction is basically equal to the momentum of the electron and the positron which is twice of 2 p cos theta fine till now what is p p is nothing but the momentum of the particle here so this is nothing but mass 
times its velocity. Now, as I already said, this mass is the relativistic mass. So, we can write this as gamma m naught v. So, this can be written as 2 m 2 gamma m naught v cos theta or h nu is equal to 2 gamma m naught c v cos theta or 2 gamma m naught c square v upon c cos theta. Now let's look at this particular term here. Here I have basically multiplied c in the denominator and the numerator. Why? You will understand it in a second. So v upon c. What is v upon c? v is the velocity of the electron and the positron. c is the velocity of light. So since the particles cannot move beyond the speed of light, so v upon c is always going to be less than 1. Also, cos theta can never have values greater than 1. Cos theta will also have values less than equal to 1. So in this particular term which contains so many individual quantities, this quantity is less than 1, this quantity is also less than equal to 1. So I can say that h nu is basically less than 2 gamma m naught c square yeah so 2 gamma m naught c square is being multiplied by two quantities whose values is always less than one so therefore this equation i can say that this is less than 2 gamma m naught c square so which is my second equation as you can see you can make a comparison between equation number one and equation number two in equation number one you have h nu is equal to 2 gamma m naught c square and in equation number two you have h nu is less than 2 gamma m naught c square this is a contradiction no conservation of energy tells us that these two quantities are equal but conservation of momentum tells us that this quantity has to be less than this quantity so this is a contradiction here it cannot be true because we know that both conservation of energy and conservation of momentum hold true in a given physical process. If these quantities are not conserved, then that kind of physical process is not possible. We end up getting a contradiction when we try to conserve both momentum and energy at the same time, which simply means that this kind of a process is not possible. This kind of a process does not conserve energy and momentum at the same time. So this kind of a process does not happen. The light photon does not become an electron and a positron because we cannot conserve momentum and energy simultaneously. The only way this kind of a process is possible is if there was some other physical object which could take some of the recoil of the initial light photon and make this equation equal. This can only happen if let's suppose there was some kind of a nucleus in its near vicinity. If there is a material medium in which this light was penetrating and there are lots of atoms then this light photon in the presence of some kind of an atomic nucleus can lead to a creation of a electron and a positron because now the nucleus can experience some of the recoil of this particular process and balance this particular equation. As you can see here, this quantity is less than this. The only way I can prevent this kind of a contradiction is if in this term there was some other momentum, let's suppose P1 associated with it. And this P1 is nothing but the momentum transferred to some kind of a nearby atomic nucleus. So pair production can only happen in the presence of an external object like an atomic nucleus, which can experience some of the recoil in this particular process to conserve energy and momentum at the same time. So one important distinction between annihilation and pair creation is that annihilation can happen anywhere. If you look at the uh, kinematics of this equation, energy and momentum is conserved in the pair annihilation case. But for pair production, you need an external atomic nucleus. So that is the answer to why a pair production cannot occur in empty space because we cannot conserve energy and momentum at the same time. Now I just want to make another point that this is also one of the most common ways in how extremely high energetic radiation interacts with matter. So you know about different kinds of phenomena that takes place when radiation interacts with matter. For example, for low energetic radiation can lead to photoelectric effect. Even lower energetic uh, uh, radiation can lead to some kind of a Rayleigh scattering. For medium energetic radiation can lead to Compton effect. For extremely high energetic radiation which has sufficient energy which is much greater than this particular value, when those kind of radiation interact with matter then they lead to this kind of a pair production process. So that's it for today. Thank you very much.